Welcome back. Tower number two of the Gary Sutton Show on WSPA. Always honored to have this next guest. He is Dr. Walter Williams. He has uh, served with the faculty of George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia, as a John M. Olin, distinguished professor of economics. He's the author of over 150 publications, which have appeared in scholarly journals. He writes a nationally syndicated weekly column that I read every day that is carried by approximately 140 newspapers and several websites. His most recent documentary is Suffer No Fools, shown on PBS stations. I was in the fall and spring of 2014-15. And based on Up From the Projects, an autobiography, and we welcome to the show Dr. Walter E. Williams this morning. He also sits in for us limbo every now and then. I'll tell you what, it's getting longer and longer, your list of things you've done there, Doctor. Good morning to you. <laughs> well, good morning to you. <laughs> Great to have you in this morning. You know, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about this trade bill right now. Have you been watching this thing at all and, and, and seeing what is going on? I see the president is actually up on Capitol Hill this morning trying to rustle up the final votes for this Trans-Pacific Agreement. That, as I understand it, would uh, the main trade bill would give the president fast-track authority to negotiate trade deals that Congress could then approve or reject but not amend. Uh-huh. Uh, a lot of this has been in so, such secretive ways. Uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm in favor of free trade, but we were talking this morning about the difference between free trade and managed free trade, which means government gets involved. When they start managing it, I think the freedom kind of disappears in a hurry. But the secretiveness of this whole thing has bothered me. What do you make of this whole deal? Well, well, well uh, I guess the, the Congress or the or the president knows that Americans are into secrets because, uh, remember, with the uh, health care bill, uh, Nancy Pelosi said uh, we have to pass it to find out what's yes. in it. And, of course, it's Paul true. Ryan came out and said something the other day. Well, as soon as this gets passed, you'll get a chance to see it. Well, I don't think he meant it that way, but that's the way it came out. Yeah, right. And, and you know, uh, and, and when, when you have to have a thousand pages to write up a, uh, a free trade bill, you know it's not free trade because, uh, because all you need to have is a sentence or two in saying that uh, Americans have the right to engage in peaceable, voluntary exchange with other people from around the world. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a, so if it's a thousand pages or two thousand pages, it's going to mean much more than that. It's going to be, as you suggested, uh, managed trade with uh, with uh, you know crony capitalism, favors for this this uh, group of people and disfavors for the other group of people. I, I just am bothered. And the secrecy is what bothers me the most. I find myself being on the side of the Democrats on this, I don't, although I don't know for the same reasons. But the idea that here again. We have all these special interests involved. And I had Senator Pat Toomey on my show on Monday, and I said to him, I said, what do you think about all this secretiveness? He said, well, he said, you know, we have to do this. We don't want anybody to have egg in their face, and we have to do these things in secret. And I'm thinking to myself, my mom used to tell me, if what you're going to do, you wouldn't do it in front of your dad or me, don't do it. And I'm thinking, <laughs> wouldn't the same hold true for the country here if the Senate and the representatives who are supposed to be representatives out there aren't going to do it in front of us? Don't do it. Yeah, well, yeah, absolutely right. And so what 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 Pat Toomey is saying, he's being reasonably honest. He's saying that uh, well, there are all kinds of secret deals, and uh, if we if we allow people to vote on it, if we allow people to make amendments, they're going to throw their they want they they're going to want their goodies as well. So. So, you know, it's, uh, it's I, I don't know, I, I'm discussing that we shouldn't call it a free trade bill. It should be called a a, uh, a crony capitalism bill. Yeah, I mean, the whole, and, and what's embedded in that whole thinking is what we're seeing in our country right now. That we don't make rules for the benefit of all citizens, uh, but we make benefits, rules for the benefit of some, which is why all those pages in there, because special interests, all kinds of other people have their hands in the pie here. Whatever happened to, to the benefit of all in a community? Well, <laughs> that's gone by the wayside. And I think that one of the big problems we have, you know, you have people saying that there's too much money going to Washington, too many too many lobbyists. There are thousands and thousands of lobbyists in Washington. Well, the problem is not money. The problem is really the power that we Americans have allowed Congress to usurp. That is, if Congress did not have the power to uh, to give favors, to give uh, special privileges, well, then there, there wouldn't be any buying of, of uh, you know, the money would not be going to Washington because... When money goes to Washington, people are seeking access, they're seeking favors and uh, special privileges. I wanted to touch on a couple of uh, commentaries that you wrote that started a few weeks ago, two weeks ago, in fact. On May 27th, you wrote a piece called Liberals Respect Me. And I don't know if you recall, but the last time you were on with me, you were talking about uh, some of the problems with Baltimore and other places like that. And, and, and you were talking about some of the facts and figures. 
And in this piece, Liberals Respect Me, uh, you you were talking about the idea, your first book, The State Against Blacks, uh, and that a lot of people come back at you and uh, come back generally and will say, well, those are ludicrous statements that you're making. Uh, yeah. And we get into this whole idea of facts versus, I, I was kind of thinking about you and Jack Webb and Graham and, and Dragnet, and I'm thinking, just the facts, ma'am, just the facts. And, <laughs> and you lay out the facts pretty well normally, and a lot of these people lay out their feelings and never the twain Shall be your thoughts well, about your article. Well, well, uh, the article uh, the "Liberals Respect Me." Uh, it was written in response to some criticism that I got from a uh, former article that I wrote uh, a couple weeks ago, and it had to do with the uh, the argument about the Republican war on women. Right, and I said that. Uh, uh, I think that the uh, the Democrats, uh, the, you know, the people who have feel leanings towards Democrats or liberals, uh, they have the most violence against women. And I was giving, <laughs> I was pointing out that that most murders in the United States are done by people who either identify with the uh, Democratic Party or or liberals. And so, and one of the facts I gave in this uh, particular column was that. If you just just look at the case of murder, it turns out that 50% of all homicides are done by black Americans. And you say, well, uh, uh, you know, what's the party affiliation or, what, or where do the sympathy, sympathies lie of black Americans? And, well, they mostly lies with the liberal and the Democratic uh, establishment. And then if you throw in uh, liberal whites and, and liberal uh, Mexicans, then, then you have, you know, it's clear that most of the murder done in this country is done by uh, liberals and people who have uh, feelings for uh, Democrats. Now, the point I was making that liberals respect me is that they the uh, that they were criticized. I got all this criticism for it, and so a lot of times liberals will t- uh, tolerate statements made by blacks, and they won't say anything like uh, uh, you know Al Sharpton can say that. Uh, <laughs> that blacks were building uh, empires when uh, Europeans were in caves. Well, uh, no, I, I, I didn't hear of any attack by the liberal media on the, or asking him to uh, support that statement. And there are other statements uh, such as, uh, I forget the... Uh, what's the fellows in charge? Of you? Julian Bond, uh, you know, he said that uh, the, that the Republican Party will fly the American flag beside the Nazi flag, and and there's no media uh, questioning of them. So I was pointing out that that uh, liberals uh, kind of respect them because they hold me to the kind of standards uh, that they don't hold other blacks to. You know, it was interesting. You said in our program that, and you and you point this out in your column. You said I'd be willing to bet a lot of money that most of the assaults, rapes, and murders of women are done by people who identify as liberals or Democrats, particularly in the case, cases of murders. Most crime, except perhaps white-collar crime, is committed by people who vote Democratic, quote-unquote. I actually had some people who wrote to me about that. And then you, what you did is you said, okay, according to the U.S. Department of Justice report, you didn't just go anywhere. You went to the, their own place, to the U.S. Department of Justice, and you talked about the homicide trends, which you alluded to a moment ago, in the United States. And, you know... Th- Facts are what they are. Uh, we've become a nation today, though, that seems to be dealing more with feelings than with facts, with perception than with truth. Oh, that's absolutely right. And uh, I was uh, reading something, and, and it, it, it's really a uh, uh, kind of kind of something eating away at our society. I was reading an article about uh, the California co- uh, college campuses, and they talk about microaggressions and the kind of things that you should not say nowadays are things like. America is a land of opportunity, or or that uh, or the, you know if you if you're against uh, affirmative action, you're you're racist, and these are things being said by faculties at the colleges, and so I mean it's a, it's a deep seated rot in our uh, in our nation, and I don't know how we get rid of it. I've been reading, I've been alluding to this to a lot of people. I've been reading this uh, this book that just came out called The State of the American Mind. Uh, it's edited by Mark Borline and Adam Bello. And one of the things that they talked about was, uh, there's 16, there 16 essays in here written by uh, leading critics of the new anti-intellectualism. And what they talk about is the idea that somehow 
we thought at, at one time, maybe back in the 70s, even 80s, that we would, uh, you know, we'd open up uh, this body of knowledge to more people. We're giving more freedom. We're becoming a more perfect union, so to speak, and that people would want to embrace the America that we had. And America kind of had a one look at that time that we wanted to be this country of assimilation and the melting pot. And, and more and more people came in that we would we would embrace this, that it would be even a better nation than it was. And yet what we've seen is a lot of our, our professors, uh, present company not included, by the way, and a lot of people out there who have been teaching. Uh, and we've, we've seen a much more divided America. The idea that the history didn't count before uh, and that now it's our feeling about history before and the revisionist kind of looks that we have mm-hmm. at things that really are most important. Comment on that, if you would. Well, I... I... <laughs> I, I think that uh, there, there, there are some things that intellectuals uh, uh, believe and college professors uh, believe that that uh, the ordinary uh, common sense uh, American uh, uh, would not believe, and, and you just you just gave examples of that. And, and just, just I, matter of fact, while you're talking, I was just looking up this uh, this uh, recent piece. It's called uh, it's put up by the College Fix, and it says professors cannot say things like everyone can succeed in society if they work hard. Uh, Affirmative action is racist. When I look at you, I don't see color. Uh, or, or where are you from? Or where were you born? Right. These kind of things are considered to be uh, uh, microaggression and, and racism. And, and, and that shows a deep rot uh, in the American thinking and the American mind. And, and we're sending our kids, we're paying huge tuitions uh, to, uh, to, and, and other costs to send our kids to be and brainwashed by these assholes. Excuse me. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> by these people on our college campuses who are, by the way, getting a lot of money for doing this. Yeah, I, you know, the, the, the thing is, too, uh, uh, when you get back to we, 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 we seem to treat everybody as member of some different group, which you, by the way, ended, ended your piece here with so nicely. You said, far more important for me in all of this is that liberals unintentionally treat me like a white person. Unlike their response to other blacks, they demand that I back up my statements. For that, I thank them. I thought it was a great ending to your piece. It well, really yeah. was. And, and you know, they, by the way, when I when I was giving a um, a lecture, this I, I started doing this way back in the mid '80s, uh, and I was giving a I was, a press conference was called for me to talk about my first book, The State Against Blacks. And before I said anything, I told all the news people there that. Uh, that they, they can ask me hard questions, they can question my uh, uh, conclusions. In other words, they can treat me like a white person. <laughs> and, and so, <laughs> so there was a kind of a you know, uh, I guess a, a little bit you know, timid laughter. But uh, anyway, uh, they 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 treat me very nicely. There was another piece that you wrote. I want to jump onto this because our time with you is short today. And again, we're talking with Dr. Walter E. Williams. Intellectual dishonesty. I read this the other day, and I was I just loved the piece. And one of the things that we hear a lot of people say today, especially when they're campaigning for something, which seems to be an ongoing process, and they'll say, you know, if they want to talk about that, let's have that debate. Let's have that discussion in this country. I don't know how many times I've heard that. Yeah. And usually that's code speak for let's not have that discussion. Let's not have that debate because it's not really settled. Yet we have people out there like Al Gore, the president, saying climate uh, change is settled. That's it. There's nothing more to talk about. So let's move on with the policy and forget about talking about it. Whatever happened to do, I want to have that debate and I want to have that chat. Well, the, you, for, for them, uh, uh, it's uh, climate change is, is settled, but uh, and, and indeed it is settled because there's if there's anything that we can say true about the climate throughout the mankind's history is that it's always changed. Yes, it is, <laughs> and it's it, I mean it's, it's it's always changing. Matter of fact, a lot of people don't know that they at one time I think it was 500 million years ago they called the snowball Earth, and there was ice uh, sometimes uh, six miles thick covering. Most most of the earth and, and now uh, evidently there's no there we don't have that kind of ice and matter of fact it was down to new jersey uh the the permafrost line now that no longer exists and uh and it, and it's not because of uh suvs uh, i'm really glad about that by the way I, I think that's good that you know we we don't have that anymore it make things a little bit more difficult but you know it's amazing to me the arrogance of human beings and i often kid people because i i taught history for 25 years before i did this and i said 
they, they said, well, where, what, do you, what do you think about you think of history? I said, for a lot of people, history is, starts the day they were born and ends the day they die. And nothing else happened outside those confines, right? <laughs> You're absolutely right. <laughs> we're going to come back and we're going to talk more about this uh, intellectual dishonesty. And also, improving black education, a piece you just wrote uh, two days ago, uh, with Dr. Walter E. Williams. He's our very special guest this morning. And he's right here on the Gary Sutton Show on News Radio 910 WSBA. Welcome back to the Gary Sutton Show on WSP with Dr. Walter E. Williams this morning, who is uh, a columnist. He's an economics professor at George Mason University at John M. Olin, distinguished professor. He's uh, got a daily column, and he's also an author, uh, and he's got a brand new book uh, that just came out called American Contempt for Liberty. And I wanted to talk about that also this morning because, you know... <laughs> You can't talk enough about liberty, I think, for people who really espouse it in this country. And and one of the things that you do in this book, Dr. Williams, is you really talk about how the idea of liberty and limited government really are the recipe for success here in this country. Oh, yeah, yes. And I, and, and, and unfortunately, uh, there's uh, Americans, uh, most Americans, uh, I'm sad to say, have uh, contempt for uh, a personal liberty and limited government. Uh, that is, most Americans believe that uh, government ought to be in the business of using one American to serve the purposes of another American. Or they believe that uh, they have the right to live at the expense of another American. That is, farmers think that they have a right to get uh, subsidies uh, or handouts from the government at the expense of other Americans, uh, uh, failing businesses or, or poor people or or college students, or, or you know, food stamps. So, and and this money does not come from Santa Claus or the two third. The only way the government can give one American citizen one dollar is to first, through intimidation, threats, and coercion, confiscate it from some other American. And the and the tragedy is, is that most Americans think that this is okay, and they uh, and they will be offended by someone who think that uh, uh, that there should be. Uh, you know, private property and self-ownership. I often think that books like this, and again, American Contempt for Liberty, you can get it at Amazon. You can also, and it's out in bookstores now, too, right? Yes, uh, yes, yeah. in all the bookstores, yeah. Uh, check it out, because, and again, if Dr. Williams is writing it, I'm reading it. Uh, but, you know, the, the idea here is that we're not just having the liberty taken away. It seems to me we're ceding it over. We're turning it over uh, unwittingly. And again, maybe the fact that we really don't understand what it is anymore. We've got some... Uh, altered state of what liberty is really is is where we're wrong. Yeah, well, see, yeah, that that that's the that's the problem. Uh, that is, uh, some Americans think that government ought to do this for them. Yes. Other Americans think that the government ought to do this and when to do that for them. Now, so if if Congress does pleases the wishes of all Americans, it will produce something in total that no no American wants. That is the a tyranny and the loss of our liberties and a failed economic system uh, and economic collapse. And so uh, that's but that's the way that we're headed. And and as I've said many times on the show that if you ask the question which way are we headed, tiny steps at a time, are we headed towards more liberty, personal liberty, or are we headed towards more government control over our lives? And it would have to unambiguously be the latter. And and the American people are are satisfied with that. I remember it maybe it was John the Baptist in the Bible who was said of a voice crying out in the wilderness. And I and I sometimes think that your voice and other voices that I think are clarion calls in this country are crying out in the wilderness sometimes uh, amidst uh, a, a much louder crowd call, which basically says, oh, come on, you, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. What What is that all about? And, and I guess my point in saying that is that while I am listening to that, and I think a lot of other Americans are listening to that, is it becoming, is it something where we can ever, ever get that idea back, or are we too far down the road to be able to uh, get back to what was an American espousal of real liberty? Well, I, I, I don't know. I, I think the answer, it's, uh, it's kind of dubious whether we can get back. I mean, just imagine, you know, somebody like James Madison said, charity is no part of the legislative duty of the government. Or uh, it's, uh, Madison said that uh, the, uh, the the role for the government, the federal government, is mostly in external affairs. Now, any politician uh, making these uh, uh, you know, statements uh, that our founders made, the American people would run out, of, run them out of town on the rail. They would just they would find the Madisonian ideas, the Masonite George Mason's ideas, and Thomas Jefferson ideas. They would find them offensive. Of course, on the Fourth of July, people get on the 
high horse and talk about the wonders of our, our founding, but if any of these founders came back or anybody started talking like these founders and running for political office, they, they would just, uh, uh, you know, throw them under the bus. What is the recipe, and maybe you've got it down here in American Contempt for Liberty, which I will read and maybe have a better, more learned question next time, but what is the recipe then for America to succeed again in terms of returning to our roots of liberty? Well, the, the recipe is very simple. Uh, it's, it's that we need to return to constitutional government. That is, we must, we must tie Congress's hands as the framers intended for Congress's hands to be tied to those things that are, are enumerated in Article I, Section 8 of the United States Constitution, the so-called enumerated powers of Congress, which are saying there are 21 things that Congress can do. And so, uh, uh, and, and none of, uh, nowhere in that list do you find the word even education or you find right. farm subsidies or business bailouts, all these things that, got, got, that Congress spends money on, they are not on that list. In, in fact, in Amendment 10 of the Bill of Rights, they make a very specific point of saying anything not specifically given to the Congress and to the federal government will be left to the states and the people. And, and they go out of their way to say that to us, and yet here we are with an education department today that seems to usurp an awful lot of power. <laughs> and that's right. And we just ask ourselves, uh, what can what can this, what can citizens in the state of Pennsylvania do without the permission of the federal government? Yeah, we, a... we can't decide how much water to put in our toilets and we flush our toilets with. Uh, we can't decide uh, uh, thousands of things that are regulated by the federal government. You can read uh, the columns by Dr. Williams. If you want to go easy, go to the Drudge Report and go down to the columnist. He's right down there at the bottom under W. And most importantly, get out there and get the book right now. Walter E. Williams, American Contempt for Liberty, worth the read. I'll be getting it in my hands today, Dr. Williams. I thank you so much for joining us and continue to have a great summer. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, doctor. Take care. Dr. Walter E. Williams with us on the Gary Sutton Show. Always a fascinating debate. We're going to put that up on Facebook.com slash 910 WSB. We'll have that up on Monday for you. Always like to have Dr. Williams' comments there.